Hello, welcome to Working Under Pleasure. So today I have the beautiful Ash, um, who is a wonderful woman, and I'm super excited for her to share her story all about the dating world, particularly around how us women can be a little bit more open-minded when it comes to men. But I never like to preempt the conversation. I always want to keep things in flow. So I will let beautiful Ash introduce herself. And welcome, Ash. Welcome to today's show. I'm so excited and so honored to have you. So can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, So I am a dating and relationship writer and certified relationship coach. Um, I started blogging a long time ago. (laughs) And through my blogging, I just started um, giving advice on things that I was experiencing, things that I was learning in life, and particularly relationships. Um, Just as I was experiencing and learning, I would just write, give advice, and it just you know, things just started picking up. From there, I started submitting my work to different online publications. And then from there, I thought, you know, I really like giving advice to women and connecting with women in a community where we can help each other. Um, But at some point, I realized that in order to really connect and help women in the way that I want to, um, I decided to go into a coach training program um, in order to better learn how to connect with women one-on-one. So I did that and became certified. Um, And so I still do, you know, in tandem, the the coaching and writing thing. And I really enjoy it. Oh, beautiful. I love that you um, really emphasize on the fact around your desire to to help women in this area, because I think so many of us, particularly high achieving women like you and I, it can feel like quite a daunting situation where maybe in your life, things are going great in your career or money wise or lifestyle with friends. But like with the man side, sometimes it can feel like, oh, like what happens? So what was kind of the key driver for you to go down this route? Because this is brave. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was in, I've been in a relationship with the same man for the last almost 16 years now. Wow. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> it, to start off with. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, you know, in the beginning of that, it was just, I, I was inspired by all the, the ins and the outs of what I was experiencing and what I was learning. And there's so much. And I understand that so many women have all these you know, issues they have, they run into all this stuff. There's so many different nuances (laughs) in relationships, so many different types of relationships. And, you know, especially now, you know, we're exploring different things with dating, you know, dating online, dating apps, um, different styles of sexuality. Um, It's all very interesting to me. And it's something that I think that it's important for women to come together and really create a community around and to help each other with and and figure stuff out and what works for best for each person a hundred percent I mean firstly 16 years we all want to know what the secrets are (laughs) yeah how what would you say is your kind of like sweet spot or yeah essence that you guys have been together for such a long period of time and, and obviously in a healthy way too Um, I would say that there, I mean, there are several things, but I think that one of the things is you have to get really solid in who you are and Mm. in what it is that you want in life from a partner and with a partner. Um, I think it's important to know what you want and what type of relationship you're looking for and being able to find a person that aligns with that and that you're compatible with. And that you can really, you know, not just someone that you're attracted to physically, but somebody who you can stand to be around for for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I mean, obviously we have, you know, people that have families around them. That's kind of like a, a, a given if you choose to, you know, continue that with a family member. But with a lover, I think a lot of people think, well... I can choose someone else down the road or with my dating apps, you know, I, you can go on and just swipe away. Like, 
how do you work with women now that are in this day and age where that is available to them? Because I can imagine for you 16 years ago, the dating apps were very, well, did they even exist 16 years ago? Did dating apps exist? From what I remember, there were dating websites like match.com and, mm. and things like that, but it wasn't like the dating apps. Like it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same as, as what it is now. It was just yeah. very like, you go on a website, you sign up, you make a profile. Um, and it, you know, you might find somebody that's like, I, I, it, there wasn't as many people on there. So it was, it was um, very like a beginning stage. I think, you know, like back in the day of like MySpace and things, like I think a lot of people met that way too. <laughs> well, how did you meet your partner? So I actually met him through uh, my sister and my sister's oh. friends. Yeah. Uh, see that. So, is- yeah, we, we met the old fashioned way. But I think that is a really good way, you know, like I find I'm naturally a matchmaker. I have two, two groups of good friends at the moment. They are both in like good partnerships and I've kind of match made them up. And I think that is a good way. If you know someone that's a decent human being and they recommend someone else, there's that element of trust from the get go between the other person and you that you're dating. Like there's that new level of respect, I feel. Um, So, hey, maybe that's what we should all be doing. (laughs) Yeah, I definitely do think that there is a difference. Like, you know, with dating dating apps today, it's like there are a lot of concerns around safety um, that, you know, that I never worried about with him, Um, you know, but I guess, I guess it's always good to be concerned about your safety, no matter who you're meeting, no matter how you meet them, you know, it's always good to, you know, to just take care of yourself and especially in the beginning stages when you don't really know someone yet. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think we all got, you know, stories to share, men, women, whatever gender you turn yourself with, with not having your boundaries up at a certain level from the get-go so yeah I'm glad that you've covered that bit it's, I think that's yeah. super important um so for you like with the clients that you work like is there a common pattern that you notice like a common kind of maybe belief or experience which is why they come and see and work with you I think that the patterns are I think that a lot of people lack confidence in themselves mm. And I think that they lack the, I think that they lack the hope in finding someone. Like there's a lot of, a lot of negative energy, a lot of hopelessness around the idea that, oh, I can't find somebody for me, you know, like the dating world is, is, you know, and I get it. It's, it is a jungle out there. But um, I think that that's that's probably the number one pattern is, you know, people are having trouble finding somebody who that they really connect with in in a, in a landscape of dating apps and swiping. It's very, you know, v- very externally based, you know, based on looks, and it's like I think a lot of people have trouble finding the depth in relationships today definitely and I think then also on the flip side of that when people do potentially have the depth they're not used to that because they're used to the other side so what because obviously the show is all about like tapping into your body and feeling into that intuition like what are is there any tips you can share with knowing that you're on to in your experience a great date or a great potential relationship or what is if you don't feel things are right like to trust yourself with that so um just so you're asking like what how do you know like whether or not you should trust yourself like going into like go, like meeting someone and, and dating for the first like initial yeah so it's almost like what are the kind of signs that you think you educate your clients around that to pre- okay that's all again to prepare themselves for a date you know like is there any kind of like energy you know having an open mind about it like is there anything you share with, to get them at the stage where they're about to go on a date to start off with because if they're all in this negative energy of like you know, oh, past experiences didn't go well. Like, where am I at? Like, it's like, okay, well, we've got to start from scratch. You've got to have an open mind because otherwise you're just going to bring the same stuff back in or you're going to look for the same signs. So, yeah. 
Oh yeah. Okay. So I gotcha. Yeah, um, I, definitely there's mindset work, um, mm -hmm. that is required in the beginning. Um, especially if you've got a lot of negative energy and a lot of, um, pessimism around, mm. around the dating world today. Um, obviously you have to understand that things aren't going to be perfect all the time. Um, and it's all about learning. Like you, you can't expect to go on a dating app and then just meet someone for the first time. And that first person that you meet is going to be, you know, your soulmate. It's a process. It's learning. It's meeting different people. And even if you don't connect with, if you, even if you find out that you don't connect with somebody, it's still a learning experience for you. So it's just, I help them like get around the idea that dating is really a learning process. It's learning about yourself. It's learning about the type of person that you want to be with. Um, so there is a level of, you have to be comfortable. I mean, obviously there is a there's, you know, you can have strategy around it and have ideas for, you know, what you're looking for, you know, and have an end goal, but it's all about enjoying the process too. It's, you know, it's kind of like that you have that middle ground, you know, don't take it too seriously, you know, have ideas for what you want, but, you know, there is a point where you, if you're taking it too seriously, um, it can just ruin the whole experience for you. And what would you say taking it too seriously looks like? Um, really really going hard on the husband hunting I oh think what is that the husband hunting what does that mean <laughs> well there are a lot of women that are like you know I want to find a husband now it's like oh really yeah I, I'm not I haven't wow I didn't know that existed oh yeah okay well what, what I mean I think like? that you know there is a lot I mean I would say that there are types of women who are like that. There are mm. other types of women that are just looking for, you know, these different dating experiences and in, in short term, short term relationships too. Mm. Um, but I I mostly work in longer term relationships. So women that come to me are looking for more long term stuff. And I think what I tend to see, because I'm 32 now and most of my friends are either in the most loving, amazing relationships. And I look at them and I'm like, mm, this is so yummy. I'm excited for when this comes in. But also all the other side where they want someone, but then they are fixated on someone that they dated like six months ago. And it's just not going to happen. Like you hear from him once a, once a month, like that's not working out. And I think... That's a really interesting pattern to see because um, it's almost like when a woman wants to be with a partner, actually stepping up and following those actions of wanting to be with someone, you know, rather than still messaging Fred that she sees once a month for a quick bang. Like, it's not like, I think it has to be in alignment with what you actually want with your actions as well. Like, do you find that's also quite common with, helping women actually step away from those habits because that's a habit right no oh, shame yes. around it at all but a lot of women don't realize I've done that before for sure like what do you do to kind of help withdraw them I suppose from that form of addiction really yeah I've actually I've, I have actually worked with women who are on the cusp of you know breaking up with a toxic relationship and then going into finding someone different I do what I will do in our sessions is walk them through what like what's working for them in that relationship or or what what it is they're getting out of you know if they're stuck on an ex or something you know I'll go through them go through with them on what they're getting out of that and how it is serving them or not and then really helping them explore what what it is that they're looking for like are, i mean maybe you know sometimes we might find that you know moving on to somebody else isn't something that's in their best interest at that point because maybe they're not ready for something new mm -hmm. so they maybe have to work through letting go first before they start meet, you know worrying about meeting someone new um so that's a possibility as well but definitely letting go of anything that you're hanging on to um it's very important before you start a new relationship for sure mm -hmm. 
Oh my God. I love that you said that because I think ah, it always baffles me. I'm the opposite. I date, I'm with someone for a long time and then I'm single for a long time. I think maybe I might go the other extreme, but um, how do you help women not do the back-to-back relationships? Cause that is, I see that a lot. And it, it sometimes I wish I was that person. I know that's not healthy either, but how do you tell and help a woman to actually withdraw, take a step back and not get into dating Barry down the road kind of thing? Yeah, well, I'll, you know, I'll sit with them, and, you know, in those emotions, the emotions that they're experiencing, because usually when they are hanging on to something, it's usually they're still getting something out of it, like the excitement of, of, of keeping that person around. Um, usually there's an, an attachment. So I do um, tend to help with that if it goes too deep. Um, I mean, there's only so much that I can do as a coach and consultant. So sometimes, you know, it might be necessary for me to refer them to a therapist or a different kind of coach, it, you know, and that happens sometimes too. But, you know, if if that's where the relationship takes us, you know, in how, you know, how can we get you positioned for a new relationship? Um and, and sometimes we have to sit with the, why are you still trying to get back with your ex? Why are you still hung up on him? Um, and, you know, I, I work with them on, you know, mindset and, you know, enjoying themselves and really, and really helping them and empowering them to understand their own sense of self and, and sense of self-worth as a, as their own single human being like you are valuable and you are somebody worth being you know being just in the world just being you know Mm -hmm. um and you don't have to you know your your value doesn't rely on you being with somebody um so sometimes we have to to sit with that for a while too yeah, I'm sitting with that for a while. I can imagine a lot of people are like, no, I'm going to run. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, there is some resistance to that. Um, but often I find a lot of women, you know, once they realize the value of of really letting go of the past, they understand why that's so important is because mm-hmm. when they enter into a re- new relationship and they're not over their ex yet, then there are problems that arise from that. Yeah, and like it's almost like taking your baggage with you to the next relationship and then it just kind of mounting up and getting stinkier and stinkier and then it's like, God knows what you're attracting into your life, to be honest, you know, or what patterns or behaviors you are bringing in from yourself, you know, because it all comes from within you, right? Um, and then what do you do in the situation where, because obviously as women, we are naturally programmed potentially to obviously want to have children by a certain age. Do you find you get women that are at an age where they have that really burning desire to create and have a family or they are programmed to think that? Not every woman obviously feels like this, but what do you do with calming them down and relaxing them to be like, look, you will find your partner, but you have to slow it down a bit. Cause that's the biological clock that a lot of women are kind of facing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it, you know, there is value in, in helping them to realize like, what it is that they really want. I mean, I think a lot of women do find that they believe that they want something that maybe isn't ultimately aligned with their lifestyle Mm -hmm. and their way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something that, you know, if I, if I had a client that was, you know, really, focus on having kids but it's like you don't even have a partner yet (laughs) exactly yeah or you know you can do you can get the IVF um sorry the donation egg donations I know her family that have done that and massive respect to single parents but you know there are other avenues but yeah I think that's a good point 
And I think it's so important to find the right person that you can be a life partner and a co-parent with. Mm. And that's probably the number one thing is there's, there's women that are so focused on having kids. It's almost like they don't even care who it's with. And that's worrying, (laughs) right? Like I think for me, I'm very lucky. My mom had me at 40 and I was her first um child and she'd have no IVF or anything and in those days that was like a a big thing and so I've got that as like an expander or or an icon really in my life I'm like I know I could probably be able to do that myself but I always think to myself I only want kids with someone that I want to procreate with you know like I don't want someone's kids if I don't like them what am I how are the kids gonna turn out you know Mm -hmm. so Yeah, I think that's a big thing because a lot of women are just conditioned to assume they want kids. That's another crazy thing. It's not for everyone, like you say. I mean, do you have people, women realize that when they're having sessions with you as well? Because that's like a whole life shift. Yeah, I have. I have friends that that are, you know, (laughs) coming around to realizing that maybe it's not for them. Mm. Um, And, you know, sometimes sometimes that's you know a tough realization to get around but you know I'm not here to tell anybody what they're you know what to do what they should want or what or not want Mm -hmm. um but yeah that's (laughs) it's definitely something that you know some women do face it um and it's and that's one of the things that I really like to emphasize in some of my writing and my in my work is really take the time to understand what it is that you really want Mm. and what you know not just what society is telling you that you think you should want you know some a lot of a lot of women will find that motherhood isn't for them and I think that that's okay Definitely. Yeah. And I think like, you know, women can birth other things. They can birth businesses or be just an amazing member of the community. Like there's all these beautiful things that women have they can create without birthing a child. Um, You know, just because we have those organs in our bodies and potentially deemed as the responsibility to do that doesn't mean we need to go ahead and do it. So yeah, I absolutely love that. And and I re- I know you're a big advocate for talking around why women are potentially not attracting kind of the right men. So like, and you write a lot about that too. So can you delve deeper into your beliefs around that and your own experiences as well? Yeah, <laughs> the thing that concerns me is that there are a lot of women that that are very focused on all the external qualities of a man, you know, his looks, his status, his career, his ability to be a, prov- a provider and protector. Um, and then it's like, okay, you know, you know, what else is, is that all you're looking for? Are you looking for a life partner? If you're looking for someone that you're going to be with for the rest of your life, you need to be looking at more things in a person than just, than just the external. Because as a lot of women find out, you know, a man can be attractive and he can, you know, have a great career and be wealthy and be a great provider and protector, but he can still be a piece of shit if, if he's cheating, if he's lying, you know, and, and, you know, if he's not a good boyfriend or a potential husband. And a lot of women do find that out. So I, I really do stress on looking for those internal qualities. Is he loyal? Is he respectful? Is he going to be cooperative? Is he emotionally intelligent? Is he going to be supportive of you? Yeah. And I think that's so beautiful because um, obviously extent, you have to be attracted to someone that you're with to an extent, of course. But I think, and I love this, the more, if I look at my types over the last year, there's no consistency in a type. Like when people ask me, what is my type? And also, I just say I don't have a type because 
I've learned, and don't get me wrong, I used to fancy that the, I was the classic. I would fancy, obviously, all the jocks, the good looking ones, the, yeah, the ones that splash their cash and things and that from the external, they look great. But yeah, internal, nothing going on. Um, and then if I look at my pattern over the last year, like I have no consistent type. You could line them up. <laughs> There's not loads, but you know, like the last 18 months, you could line them up and there's no consistency in them. Age, everything, interest, country, culture, anything. And because I got to know them and I saw parts of them that I could see in myself, either I liked or I didn't like, which is obviously a mirror with whoever you're with. But also I always like to pay attention when I'm on a date with how a guy treats the waiter or the staff or when I'm grabbing a coffee, how he treats the coffee people. And I've been quite surprised because I found I would attract a certain type at one point where they would treat me like an absolute queen and, you know, uh, just emotionally. But when it was someone who they perceived as a lower status, they wouldn't respect them. And that would be an absolute no-go zone for me. Like you treat everyone the same, you know? And I found that was a consistency in my type for a little while. And I was like, what is that within me? Am I creating that behavior myself? So, which I wasn't, but I think I had a limiting belief around how I treated myself in certain situations. Um, But I think it is a big one for women to cultivate that because first impressions, let's be honest, is looks. So how much time or how do you educate a woman that she's like on a dating app, right? And that's why I don't like dating apps personally for me. That's, it's what we're conditioned to do. Do they look hot? How tall are they? What country they're from? You know that before you even meet them. So how can a woman actually, who's really trying to change her type right now, actually start that? Because that's a big thing. Yeah. And you know, looks being attracted to somebody is important, you know, I'm not saying, you know, be with somebody that you're not attracted to. That's not what I'm saying at all. You know, you can go on a dating app and meet someone that you, that you think is, is attractive and then read more about them. How much do they have on their profile? Like, and just kind of, you know, feel it out, talk to them, you know, meet them. It's, it's a process, but I like what you said about, you know, about not having a certain type. I think that there are, you know, sometimes in conversations, my, I think sometimes my message does get um, confusing to some people that are like, oh, well, you just have all this criteria and it's, you know, just a list that you're checking off. And it's, 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 it's more than just a list it's it's you you know you don't have I don't have like a list of things to you know for for a woman to check off it's it's more like like you said like you can go on dates with different kinds of people and they're different types of men but there are principles and patterns that you start to notice that you are more connected with certain people than others and I do think that there are underlying things like you said like how do they treat the waiter and mm-hmm. and, and things like that so that that's more aligned with like their behavior right so you go okay well behavior and how respectful they are to others is is pretty important and you, you know you can build like a foundation of things that you want that way as well Yes. And I think values play a big part as well. Like our values change so much as we grow as people. And recently I've taken a step back and I've gone through my values and how that aligns with my business and my friendships and my relationships. And I've been like, wow, because this is what really impresses me that you've been with someone for 16 years. Like surely your values and who you are has flourished and changed and gone through darkness like how have you maintained that with another person for 16 years yeah (laughs) yeah I think we're lucky because in the beginning we were still I mean we were in our early 20s in the beginning so we were still kind of immature in certain ways Mm -hmm. um and I think through the years we have grown we have gone through a lot of the same things together. You know, we've moved a lot together. 
Um, we've had a lot of financial, <laughs> a lot of financial troubles. You know, we've been broke together. Shay, we've been riding the bus together in the beginning. Um, <laughs> and so, I don't know, we've, we've gone through a lot of the same stuff. You know, we've both lost, you know, I lost my mom. He lost both of his parents, you know, before age 35. Um, so we really supported each other through that. Um, you know, we've had health and or health issues, injuries. Um, you know, there was a time where I, where he had an accident at work. Um, he, he broke his foot in six different places and he was basically, you know, like in a bed and in a wheelchair and on crutches for like six months. So I was basically his nurse for six months. Um, and that really, I mean, I, I felt a real growth through that period as well, because, you know, just being, you know, having that experience of really being a partner, like someone that's like, I am there for you in this time. When you go through life together with somebody, um, it, it really helps bring you together because it really helps you form that special bond and it helps you realize how much you really do love someone and how much you are willing to go through to be there for them and to help them in life. Wow. Yeah. And I think just that you, like you said, you've had that experience where you've kind of grown up together, I guess, and in so many areas of your life, which is so beautiful. And then for people that aren't obviously at that age now where they're like 30s or 40s, like, I guess obviously you still grow, but you go through different things. Like, how do you, what like tips do you give someone that's at a different age where they still want that, you know, they want to be with their partner for however long and experience that depth of life is up highs and lows, which is inevitable. How do you, yeah, walk someone through that or prepare them for that because I think as independent women as well the prospect of sharing your life with someone else that's also another big mindset shift right you know we could all think that we want this amazing man but actually like are you willing to like you said be the carer if they become sick or you know go through mourning and I'm so sorry about to hear about that with your family you know like to go through that together that's a big that's a whole life-changing thing. So for these independent women, what, what, how do you help prepare them for that? Because that's a big ego thing as well. Not that there's anything, we're not going to shame the ego, but that is a big protection mechanism. I can speak to that for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I think I, the thing that I, that how I lead is through curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I ask a lot of questions around, you know, you can be an independent, like I, I consider myself an independent woman. Like I have a very, you know, I, I'm just independent minded. And I think that a lot of what, the thing that a lot of women misunderstand is like, if you're with somebody, then that means you're not independent. And I, and I don't think that's true. I think that you can have independence with somebody else. You know, it's, you can be a full functioning, happy person with yourself, whether you're single or with somebody, but at some point you do realize, a lot of people realize that they, are better partnered with somebody else than living the rest of their life single. And if they want to live the rest of their life single, that's fine too. Um, but I focus on the women who are like, well, maybe, you know, when, when something bad does happen in my life, I want someone, you know, I want to have someone be there for me. And I want to be there for someone else when they're going through a hard time. So I, I help them with that realization that you don't have to give up your independence if you want a life partner. That's a big one. I'm literally thinking that as you speak, like that's huge. And I think when you say around wanting to be there for someone as well, that's going through challenging times, I think a lot of people don't potentially want that as well. You know, they think they do, but when something catastrophic happens, 
there's the connection, but it's like the support is a big, how would you say the separation between having your independence, but obviously still being there for your partner? Because a lot of things I, myself included, have done in previous relationships where, and a lot of my friends have shared this too, where they feel like they've lost themselves because they've become so involved in supporting their partner, you know, that they haven't actually prioritized their business, their self-care, their girlfriends, you know, how do you help change that? Because the women we feel we should be givers a lot of the time. Yeah, I think that for me, at least the foundation in that is maintaining your sense of self and maintaining the, the things that you enjoy by yourself. There are things that, that I do by myself that he has no part in. You know, uh, on the weekend, sometimes I like to go and lay out by the pool and I just, I just lay out there by myself and he's in, he's in the house doing, you know, something completely different. So I really like to help women, you know, explore and understand what it is that you like to do, like your hobbies, your interests, Mm -hmm. your social life, what it is that they like to do that he has nothing to do with. And I do think that there is, you know, you can have a partner, you can have a life partner, you can have a husband, a boyfriend, and still maintain your own individuality in your own life that is separate from him. And I, I think that that's completely okay. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have to spend 100% of our time with our partner. Yeah, I love that. And I also think it's important to like to have your own hobbies. Like I remember I used, I went through a phase where I wanted to date a guy that would love yoga. He'd love meditation. He'd love dance. He'd love all these things. Cause I love them. And then I was like, I don't want him with me all the time. Like, yeah, I want to go do my own yoga. I want to see my girlfriends for brunch, you know, like I want to go train on my own. Like, and I think equally if your partner wants to do the same, that's very healthy because I know I've seen some relationships where the partner wants to be with them all the time. And I I could not, I could not, <laughs> I couldn't handle that. I think I've actually gone for the opposite where I've had some partners that have wanted to not spend <laughs> enough time <laughs> where, you know, that was a pattern that I've broken. But yeah, I think because a lot of women may not even now know, you know, if they work for themselves or they're very career driven, what their own hobbies are. So maybe it's almost like start dating, but also start working out what you like in your life. So you can have those boundaries and that establishment for you doing, filling up your own cup, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Date yourself first. Date yourself (laughs) first. Date yourself first. And and it sounds corny, but love yourself first, right? Like, yeah, you know, it, it it might sound cliche to some people, but it is true. I mean, like you have to love yourself. You have to be confident and just solid in who you are, what you like to do. Mm-hmm. And all those hobbies, those interests that you enjoy doing as a single person, like you can still do those when if you're with somebody. And, you know, it's and I think that that's the main thing about staying independent in a relationship, because, you know, like I said, you can't spend 100 percent of your time with your person. You're going to get sick of them. Trust me. <laughs> Yeah. And from someone, <laughs> yeah, that's been in 16 years of a successful relationship. That is great advice. <laughs> I I mean, there was a time, there was a few years where we worked together, we and we lived together. Oh. So it's like, you know what? <laughs> there were times where I'm like, this is great. I love being around him, but I would love to have some girlfriend time. <laughs> How and it's that? like yeah. how did you navigate that? you know what, we're, we're two introverts and we like to, you know, we, we like to retreat into each other, but you know, we, I mean, we didn't really work side by side together all the time. So there was some separation like during work, but we just, I mean, you really have to enjoy, enjoy those daily moments, you know, enjoy the person and like I said, I mean, there were things that I would do that he wasn't a part of. And likewise, and if you're with somebody who 
you can be within a healthy relationship, someone who respects the fact that you have your own things that you want to go do that they that they're not involved in. And I think that that's important too, is not only maintaining those interests and hobbies that you enjoy doing by yourself, but also having somebody that understands that too. Like, okay, you want to go to brunch with your girlfriends, you know, have a good time, not someone who's like, oh, well, who is it? And someone who's like, oh, well, you got to check in with me after, you know, a half hour. I mean, like, you know, like that stuff is is not necessary. (laughs) That's not something that I've, you know, that has ever been a big issue Um, is, you know, okay, you want to go do this thing, you know, have fun. Yeah. I've, I noticed I went through a phase where I'd had guys that didn't necessarily have close guy friends. This is a long time ago. And then I went to the other extreme where they had really close, close bro mates. So it almost be like, we'd go on a date and two of his, his, you know, bro mates would be there. So it went from one extreme to the other, but I went through a pattern where it was almost like I was the fixer for them, you know, because they'd see um, me as the social one that had a good group of friends and had the career and everything. Like for those women that attract that sort of man, what do you, what advice would you give them to adjust to the balance of receiving from a man but also them not being the fixer. Cause that's something I've realized I've got into quite a polarity of I've been the fixer and then I've had the fixer. And then the normal feels like, Oh, weird. Do you mm-hmm. find that often? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. I'm normal. <laughs> normal on quote. No, it, you know what? And I've had, I've had experience with that too. And sometimes sometimes even now it's hard <laughs> because sometimes it, it you know I just naturally like to help people and and this isn't just limited to romantic relationships you know I have to watch myself with family and friends sometimes I like to be the fixer and I I like to overstep some boundaries sometimes and I have to watch myself and be like you know what this is not my problem <laughs> Because if you get too into it, you know, I think the thing there is you, your emotions get tied into the problems of somebody else and you can't tie your own, your own goals and narrative for somebody else that, because their goal might be different than yours. Like, even if sometimes it's hard for me to, to, you know, see somebody who I care about having a problem and then. I almost start to start to think, well, I know what's best for them and they don't know what's best for them. Um, But the thing is, if somebody's having a problem, they have to want to fix it themselves. You can't fix a problem for somebody else if they're not wanting to fix it themselves. Mm -hmm. It's that whole, you know, you can't lead a horse to water. I mean, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yeah, it's, it's that, I mean, you can help somebody, but you also have to know the boundaries for yourself, Mm. you know, you can be supportive, but then understand when to step back and when to, to be like, I can't fix your problem for you. 100%. And also, (laughs) I think there's a really interesting, like codependency with that as well, you know, where the one that wants the fixer needs then becomes that reliance goes back to your thing around boundaries right wants the fixer and then the fixer also wants to fix the person and that like polarity how do you break how would they break that cycle because that's that's a something that can happen slowly over time I've been in relationships like that before yeah, you just have to get grounded mm-hmm. in, in, you know, the boundaries within yourself and understanding the lines that you shouldn't cross with, you know, trying to fix someone else and then having someone try to, you know, fix your problems. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to step back, you know, you can love somebody and want to be there for them and support them. Um, But then ultimately let them 
figure their shit out for themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I remember I learned this the hard way. It was my first ever relationship. I was 18 through to 20, nearly 21. And I actually ended up having to get a restraining order from him because he became like abusive towards the end because, I mean, this is a long time ago. So I've done a lot of work through that, but I was fixing him. And then I, w- and then he, uh, there was just so many boundaries that were overstepped that I was like, that's enough. And then he just flipped because it was almost like that crack cocaine had been taken away from him and he just destroyed everything and people in his way. And I think that has been a really good lesson for me to spot the early signs of when you set up a boundary, if the boundaries overstepped at the early phases, thank you, goodbye. I think that's, Mm -hmm. yeah, what I've learned. So yeah, I love hearing your story on that. I think that's great advice. I wish I'd met you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and sometimes you do have you know is you know if someone else is trying to overstep mm. your boundaries and you know try to fix all your problems sometimes it is necessary to you know break contact you know and be like hey and I've had to tell people this I've had to tell someone in my family before like thank you for your concern but I'll take it from here <laughs> like this is my problem yes. this is my issue yeah I've had to tell people that (laughs) that's fascinating and it's fascinating when people word it as in their concerns and you're almost like well that's that's not do you know what I mean the underlying meaning of these things of how people can word it when it's not as obvious as you think it is and then when you take a step back and you honor yourself and realize oh that yeah they're overstepping my boundaries that they're coming across is in they're concerned or it's a kind way I think that's really fascinating like to take things slow and realize are they still being sly and actually overstepping things or if it's obvious that's amazing but often it's not obvious I find yeah I I had I had a family member that you know was essentially trying to run my relationship and I had to tell this person like you know, it, you know, and I'm the type of person that I like to, I like to find a good way to communicate the fact that I appreciate their trying to help and their concern. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that was really important for me is to find the right attitude, to find the right wording, to be like, all right, I understand that you're concerned about this, but, you know, my, what I want for my relationship might not be what you want for my relationship. So I'll take what you're saying in in your suggestions into consideration, but ultimately I have to be the one to manage my own relationship. Totally, totally. And also like, it's their stuff that they're projecting onto you. Like it's never your unless you go to someone and ask for advice, um, it's no one's business. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing I had to come, you know, in, in my younger years, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard because it's like some, some people are very vulnerable to just taking people's advice, whatever it is, you know, if someone, older than you that you trust is giving you advice and you know at some point I had I had to realize like that's you know what they want that their narrative and their goals for me aren't the same as my goals for myself so yeah I definitely had to learn how to have that boundary of you know thank you for your advice but you know I'll take it from here definitely I think that's such good advice as well like no matter if someone's older than you it doesn't make a difference like unless you ask them then thank you goodbye well Mm -hmm. oh so much wisdom shared on this one I love this um one question I always like to ask my guests at the end of the show is is there a little pleasure that you have in life that you enjoy by the sounds that maybe doing on your own or a little thing that you do just to like look after yourself 
I would say the thing that I enjoy doing most is taking time, like taking down time to myself. Mm. Um, I try to do this at least once a week where I just am with myself and I'll just get a snack. Um, I really am into pasta salad. <laughs> Ooh, okay. This is great. Because I've had a lot of people recently on the show be like, they love eating candy. And that's the first thing they do in the mornings. And I'm pretty anti sugar. So okay, cool. Love this. And just have your own time. Yeah. And just watch, I don't know, something in a, a you know, a guilty pleasure. <laughs> um, I really, I would say a guilty pleasure of mine is watching reruns of Sex in the City. <laughs> Oh, amen, sister. Yes, I'm on board with that. Yes, <laughs> love that. So I'll just I'll just get a bowl of pasta salad and watch Sex in the City. And it's like the best time for me. I don't know. It's you just something that you can indulge in that is, you know, to that is your own to yourself. And everybody has something different, but it's how I unwind, you know. Uh, like I said, I'm an introvert. So like my alone time is very important to me, my downtime and just having a moment where I can not think about work or not think about relationship or not just, you know, just enjoy the moment, the present moment. Um, and it's so important. I'm I'm similar. I'm an introverted extrovert. So like I come across very woo people and I love being around people. But yeah, I'm Sundays is my day. Like you're not going to get hold of me on a Sunday. Like I have to do my thing. And if I have to do something, it will only be editing, producing a podcast. And that's it. If I have to do something. Um, See, so yeah, I also think it's important to maybe have like a day or a time that's set aside for you. I know for parents and things, that's a challenging one. But yeah, make time for you is everything. So oh yes. wonderful well ash thank you so much for joining today beautiful particularly it's so early for you over there as well um if anyone wants to hear more about you where can they find you and i will then add all the details in the show notes okay you can find my website at dames that um that's my blog and i try to keep up with posting articles weekly uh, <laughs> but you can find all the stuff that i write there um, if you want to work with me on one-on-one, -on -one, I do one-on-one -on -one consulting, coaching, and you can find that there's a tab on the main like menu bar on my website. You can click on that and that, you know, it'll take you to all the information about working with me. I mean, I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram, TikTok at Ash Pariso. Right. I love that. And what's the difference between the consulting and the coaching then for you? I'm curious. So, I mean, that's, kind of, um, so actually coaching is more like, coaching is more about empowering the, the client to come up with their own solutions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do both because some people like just getting advice, like straight advice, like what is your opinion on what I should do about this? Um, so that's consulting. So, um, if you want me to just give give you my advice, I can do that. Um, if you just want a more longer term relationship, like coaching, like me, you know, go through all the steps and help you figure out your own solutions for yourself. And I can do that as well. I love that. I love that you offer both because I think it's important for different circumstances and different people. So thank you so Definitely. much. And thank you for being you. And thank you for everything you do to empower women. I think it's so special. And thank you so to have you on today's show. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>